Yes. So next, uh, we have Mohammed, uh, and he's going to tell us about what the hardware actually does. Uh, and you have your own laptop, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's. James is with me. James, we want to come up and talk about the so we're both are gonna kind of team tag you guys. And by the way, um, for a decade, um, my bane of life was better tooling. So I, I really want to kind of <laughs> uh, talk to anybody who wants to talk about that. And there was uh, some, I think yesterday, some people made some comments about um, health of uh, devices. And we have a lot of work going on in the research about that as well some data science type work as well. And if the community wants to kind of talk about that, I'll help you do um, later on. There we go. So you want to come in and introduce yourself? Yep. Hi, I'm James Borden. I work for Seagate. I'm in the uh, product planning group and uh, you know I support uh, large CSPs and uh, you know, working for product architecture groups to try to make sure that we have products that you know meet the needs of our customers. So I have, you know, I, I span engineering and I span customer marketing and engagement. And you know, today we're talking about, um, and Mohammed will be talking more about the file system side of it. But I'll be talking about some of the basically the problem statement and what we've been looking at and thinking about in this space. Um, it's in, in, in the industry here, we've been, uh, you know, growing capacity, you know, significantly over the last few years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, it wasn't that long ago that a one terabyte drive was pretty standard. And in the, in the last couple of years, we've been getting around the 16 or 18 terabyte range as we've been topping out, topping out on the uh, PMR technology, you know, we've reached uh, pretty much the limits of that. And now you see the industry starting to implement, uh, you know, energy assisted, which uh, in, in the case of Seagate, you know, we call it a host uh, is, uh, you know, hammer, which is uh, uh, heat assisted magnetic recording. Um, I think generically in the industry, we're calling it as energy assisted recording. Uh, WD has something they're working on called MAMR, which is micro microwave assisted, but it's still basically just works on the, the concept of energy assisted where we heat up the head, uh, in our case with a laser, uh, heat up the media with a laser, and the, and the, in the case of uh, MAMR, they heat up the media with uh, basically a microwave signal, uh, heats up the media, you can write the bit and it cools off, then you have uh, higher density drives. Can you give me temperature so people realize how hot they're heating up? How hot are we heating it up? That's the question. Um, I do not know that specific data. Uh, can, I, can I just say that um, it's eye poppingly hot? It's eye poppingly hot, but it's very localized. Yeah. It's, it's, at a, it's at a microsecond, nanosecond, you know, um, scale level. And so it's not like if you, if you measure the temperature of the entire device, you will see it much more higher. But it's, yeah. Oh no! I said that I saw the process. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, the interesting part of this is, you know, it's it's it, the device doesn't run any hotter, and the uh, basically the power draw of the device is inconsequential, even though we're using uh, heat assisted magnetic recording. It's uh, it's phenomenal technology. I wish I had the exact specs on it here, but I do not. But as these capacities increasing, uh, th this is a good thing for the industry. But at the same time, we're you know, running into other issues with, uh, you know, IOPS per terabyte, um, which if you, if you look at a single actuator drive uh, back, you know, eight terabyte range, uh, we've been growing them to 14, 16, 18, 20, et cetera. And what we've been finding, even though we're increasing the capacity, the throughput of the drives is not significantly in improving. I mean, we're spending the drives at the same rate, transferring data at the same rate, we're dealing with SATA and SAS ports, those kinds of things. So the effect of IOS per terabyte, as you add more capacity, is going down because the, the overall IOS per the device is remaining the same. And what we're finding, especially, we've seen this a lot in, with several customers and the cloud service providers is somewhere we're running into an issue where customers are uh, unable to drive the IOPS they need to get the quality of service they need in the uh, the drives. 
And as a result, uh, they're having to do, you know, some, some unnatural things, uh, you know, for example, they're having to, uh, you know, do things like, you know, deploy lower capacity drives, go wider instead of deeper. Uh, in some cases, uh, you know, we, I have one particular customer that can't deploy any more than a 10 terabyte drive before they run into IOPS walls that are having to go wider. And that's not very productive. It increases the cost and the floor space cost of your data center. Or they're, show, they're short stroking uh, or doing unnatural things, having to add more SSDs, increasing the cost of the data center again. So what we've been looking at is, you know, we need to find a way to uh, improve this IOPS per terabyte line and get it back up to what the SLA is going to be. And to do that, you basically have to drive more data through the drive. And uh, to do that, there's really only a few ways. To, uh, the most logical way is to add another actuator into the drive. Uh, in this case, the uh, uh, we have a product called it Exos 2X. I don't remember the exact name ever. Uh, where we've added basically where we had one actuator with 16 heads on talking to 16 sides of the platter. We've now split it into two, where we have an eight and an eight. And what that has done is allow us to transfer effectively twice the uh, IO out of the drive because we have two active uh, actuators and two active uh, heads at one time. Yeah, it's, uh, we call it the Mach 2. Uh, it's basically doubling the uh, throughput of the drive. Uh, it's uh, it's SAS only. It's uh, Right now, it's set up as dual LUN. Uh, and we're looking at other possibilities of other, you know, a lot, there's been some customer draw and doing different things. Some of our initial customers have been dual LUN and dual LUNs requiring SAS. And, uh, you know, maybe you want to you know, step in here and start talking about the architecture. And, uh, you know, basically single port SAS, dual LUN, two, two active channels, and I'll defer to you on that. Right. The rest so, of the details. As you can see, the previous slides were marketing slides, and this is definitely drawn by an engineer, and not a marketing slide anymore. So um, while we talk about it, the, the thing um, I just want uh, you guys to think about um, and give us feedback either after the talk or later on um, in the afternoon, um, whatever we implemented in this product is what's going to ship out later this year or early next year. But what we're really looking for is that this is kind of a technology where it's going to actually have an impact on the file system, ZFS being one of them. So um, there are others where we, we had a 10 terabyte and a 12. We just recently released a 16. It's the same actuator. It doesn't. It's just adding capacity, right? So it doesn't make a difference to the file system. But as all file systems have an inherent bias about how data is laid out, and so we on our SSD side of the business have worked with file systems to make them more optimal. Our competitors have done that. So as we make more dual actuator drives or multi-actuator drives in the future, we really want to understand what the, how the file system works and get feedback from the actual developers, and that's why we're here. Just to kind of give you food for thought, we're even thinking NVMe HDDs. These are not um, others. So if you work in that space, something to think about. Should the namespace be tied to an actuator? Should it not be? If, you, if we have currently dual line, if you go single line, how is the LDA space going to be separated up? Should it be interleaved? Should it be bifurcated? What we, we, we say is that, hey, half of the drive is on one side, half of the other. What would the ZFS community feel like that would be optimal? What is what is the best thing to do here? So in this particular case, the way um, I can I can drive it. Um, so the, the one which is on the truck, so to speak, um, it's like James said, it's dual line, but it uh, shares the cache. We have two independent um, channels in the back, so read and write channels are independent for each of the actuators. So as you read it, you can actually get twice the throughput. It's not always twice the throughput, it depends on your workload. So just in the interest of time, I'm gonna go quickly. So um, maybe back, can't read, but these are different you know, workloads, random reads, random writes, whatever. The, the best one you can probably get is the sequential reads and sequential writes, and you almost get 2x, and I can show you a demo on how, how that works. But some of the others, um, it really depends on how the workload is, how the coupling between the two actuators are, how the cache is being used, things of that nature. Some of the things to kind of um, look into, I don't know if ZFS does a lot of flushing in the middle, but if you do, it flushes both the LUNs. So something to think about in the future. That, that's a design decision, by the way. 
that can be changed in the future. So that's um, things to kind of note as you integrate some of these. Um, so this slide basically talks about how load balancing is kind of um, tricky once you have dual actuators. So some of the things it talks about is how much IOPS you can get if you're doing one kind of workload versus the other, where the coupling comes from. It's a lot more details than, than you guys probably are interested in. Um, a little bit more on the, so currently it's SaaS product. As you know, SaaS does not has a NV, um, admin queue like the NVMe does. So every time you actually send an admin command or quote unquote something to do with the, it, it may affect both ones, may not affect both ones, it depends. We have a report runs um, command, but also we have a report opcode command, which actually tells you which opcodes are tied to a one versus not one. And we have all the details if you guys are interested. But the fact that SAS does not have an admin queue, so to speak, it has the SCSI enclosure services that is a little different, but not the in the NVMe concept and admin queue. So general considerations, it's, it's um, you know, some of the things are, are um, this, this talks about like in, I don't know if the picture earlier on um, kind of gives you a idea of how it's, uh, let me see. So it's the same pivot, but it has two things coming up, right? So somebody yesterday was talking, why can't we have another actuator here, another actuator here? Um, this real estate at the OD is really important. So you don't want to put an actuator current design, we decided that that real estate is much more important than whatever benefit you will get an actuator on the other side. So those are the kind of um, other design decisions that we made in this particular case. And that might change as you know we go in the future. We wanted to keep it three and a half inch form factor so that it's plug and play everywhere. Um, let's see. This talks about like how you can um, configure it different ways. Uh, one way is to actually just, um, in Linux, you would do a device mapper. Right, so um, I know DFS. You can actually do some mirroring. If you do that, um, just make sure that you're that's not your only VDEV, and because if it one lose one one is gone, most likely the other one is gone as well. So you can lose data, but also you can actually do it just totally independently and aggregate it somewhere else and and get the, the most throughput out of it. Um, this talks about the same. Um, you guys have the the rate DFS has the rate Z, um, so you can actually do. Um, you know, basically LUN zeros or even LUNs versus odd LUNs. And that way you can kind of divide it up and you will get the same throughput on each line. And I can show if I have time for the demo um, how this is happening. So um, you can create your pools with all even LUNs on one and all odd LUNs on the other and then get the best of uh, both worlds. Um, just real quickly, how uh, I didn't have a free BSD, so I apologize. Uh, but uh, from a Linux standpoint, how things are. Um, are showing up. I have an, uh, an enclosure with about um, 12 drives. Six of them are single actuator and six of them are dual actuators. So it shows up a single actuator. You would see that if you do a proc file system SCSI, the line comes up at zero, but in a dual actuator, you'll see two lines coming up with the same ID. So that's one way to look at it. You can do a cat pro um, proc file system SCSI and then just prep on the ones and you'll see these are the single actuator ones and then these are the, all the dual actuators. It's all in the same enclosure. So that's one way to look at it. Um, again, in the proc file system, some people try to look at it this way, just trying the same thing. Um, the single actuator will come up as a single one and the other one is the dual one. If you really want, like earlier talk about the whole dev tree, if you want to go down that path, it shows up like that. If you actually want to have just find out like, hey, is my device a dual line or single line? So this one was a single line device in the same enclosure. You say, you know, SG lines, and it will show only one line. You say SG lines, it will show two lines. That's how you know there are two lines out there. So that's mostly about SAS topology. Um, this just talks about that's my enclosure, and I, and I, you know, LS SCSI is another way to kind of look at it. Most people use that tool. The first six drives are 10 terabyte drives, and they're all single actuator, and the rest of them are dual actuator drives. So they're showing up as it's a 14 terabyte drive, but it's split in two, so two lines, seven each, showing up all the way down. So what did I do? Um, what I did was I, I can show it in, um, in demo too if you have time, uh, but basically I just ran FIO on each one of those devices create a small little bash script that starts FIO on every one of them. And you can see the throughput. Um, this is the single actuator. Um, 
the um, the IO map kind of screws up your. <laughs> but this is basically um, SDC SDB, which were the single actuators. They're giving me the throughput for a sequential read of 236. And the other ones, which are dual actuator, are giving me the throughput of the same for each one of the lines. So that shows that each actuator is pumping out, you know, 230 to 250 aggregated 500 megabytes per second for a sequential read. Right. Um, so this shows again the same same type of thing. And I was trying to figure out how to do the pooling so that I can show somehow that this is relevant. Um, so what I created was I. Um, I partitioned the single actuators into two partitions equal size. And then I created one pool of you know, SDA1 and SDB1 and the other pool of SDA2 and SDB2. And then on here, as you can see, it was dual one, so I did the odd even thing. So all of the even ones are in one pool and all the odd ones are in another pool. So I have now four pools. Everybody with me so far? So single actuator created two different partitions and in dual actuator, I already have you know dual lines, so didn't have to create any partitions. I created those. <clears throat> so this is what it shows up. Um, I can do a live demo, but um, let me just go through the slides and I can come back and show you guys what it looks like. But what I did was again sequential reads because that was the easiest one to kind of go ahead and do. Um, I did the P1. So going back, my partition. Partition one, partition two, these are both on only the single actuator drives, just two pools aggregated that way. And then these are the dual one, um, even one on one and odd one on the other. So when I did just on the partition one, <clears throat> I'm getting 252 megabytes per second. And this is what the, um, the IO looks like from, um, from an IO stat perspective. I didn't, I'm not a ZFS uh, expert, so I don't know which knobs to turn to get the most out of it. Um, maybe we can talk about it in the hackathon and how to do it. But this was my profile, what it looked like. <clears throat> in the dual line process, I get a little bit less, but I haven't quite figured out is it because uh, ZFS prefers uh, partitions over raw devices? Is it something else that I'm doing differently? But the, the, the more interesting part is, then I created a small little bash script that I can show you <clears throat> which does nothing but actually starts, you know, again, the same FIO, uh, flushes the cache, everything is clean, starts the FIO on both of them together. So let's see, the partition one, I was getting 352, right? But when I started together, now it has to seek on both, same, same actuator has to seek both partitions at the same time, because IO is going on both the pools. And it drops to 138 and 140. In the case of dual actuator, so in the dual actuator, I was at around 269, 270, just doing it as is, nothing special. And in the other case, when I start running both of them at the same time, it pretty much keeps up. It's a little bit up and down. I don't know where the, the, the little different comes from, but I was at 269, and I can pump both of the pools at 265 and 239. Um, I'm sure if I aggregate it over many runs and then create an average, it will probably be more even, but that's what it came out to be. So um, do we have time for a quick demo or? Sure. Okay, great. So. Yeah, from a device perspective, you know, we're obviously interested in what makes the most sense for ZFS to see. Is it, is it two LUN, single LUN, flat LVA space? Oops. You know, those kinds of things, uh, dual port. Um, I mean, right now we have dual lungs, uh, and that was largely driven by our early customer adoption uh, candidates who, who wanted dual lungs because they want to manage it the lung level way up in the uh, up in the upper part of the stack, and they can drive the I/O. So we're looking to get feedback on what makes sense from your guys' perspective. Right. Uh, um, talk about tooling. Um, there's a open source tool called OpenCChest, and it can show you all all the cool little things about any device, not necessarily a Seagate device. And it's telling you all these different things. This I have a um, customer test unit, so that's why the WWN is all messed up, but otherwise you will see an actual WWN come up. The other thing I wanted to make sure that people understand, currently it's saying that we look ahead, write cache, and um, some of the other NVC caches are not supported or not available. Um, it's just a firmware thing, so we are um, creating a new firmware or uh, releasing a new firmware this month or later this month. 
um, that would actually support all of those. So um, that's one of the other differences. Um, something that we can do, all right. Uh, so let's go with, so I'm running just a regular IOSTAT to, to see all the drives. And um, this is a, a script that I wrote, just simple little script goes to all the devices and then start doing a, a libAIO lib uh, sequential reads, right? So it's doing nothing, it's just saying, hey, go create those uh, files and then just start them right away. So if I run that, you should see all of this start to... <coughs> So here we see the IO top going crazy, but on the other hand, you see everything, every one of the single actuator as well as each of the dual one is pumping data at the same rate. So that's in the sequential kind of workload. Um, I can do the same thing with the pools that I created. So All right, so let me just do that. I should have just typed it. Finding the right one is, okay. So this is only the single actuator. And this is again a script that just basically runs a bunch of IO on all of them. So it clears up the memory, then shows you that all the memory was freed. Now DFS is actually trying to do some, um, it's a 10 gig drive, uh, 10 gig file that it's trying to read from the pool. And these are the megabits per, per, per spindle that I see being read. I'm not exactly sure why it's not all the way through. That's what I was, Matt, emailing you back and forth about, but it seems like it, it works um, in terms of um, you know running both the the um, the partitions pools which are on the partition separately. And once this dies down, let me actually just quickly just do the whole thing because it will be quicker that way. Um, and so this one is a test which goes to. I mean, actually, just show you. Nothing special. It goes to each one of the the, um, the the two data sets, and there's already a file out there called test, and it just is reading it. So it does nothing more than drops all the caches, just shows you what the free memory is, and then individually starts reading from each of the pool, which are one of them is even, one of them is odd. That's all it's doing, and. Probably easier to so do the same thing, and you will see each one. Of, I'm showing the whole thing, so but each one of those lens is independently pumping whatever the single actuator one was pumping. So basically, showing this that goes. So with that, um, just the final slide. Um, this talks about that we're trying to refine how um, the LUN or the, the, you know, in the SAS topology, how it should be. Maybe in the future, if the community sees it better, we will, um, rather than actually showing a topology of two LUNs, just one LUN, dual port, right? Um, in the case of, um, we're also thinking about how to do it in SATA. There's some um, progress there too. There are some customers who are looking for that. So dual actuator SATA, which has, as a topology does not allow dual LUNs, so it has to be single. And so how the LBA space will be in that case and what the file system would prefer, we'll love to. And how it's discovered you know, through, through the device enumeration. There's several, lots of ways to do that too. Right. So one thing is uh, for sure that I want to make sure is that uh, as a Seagate, we're not, um, we're not uh, holding back from multi-actuator. So in the future, we will be just because we see that as the capacities grow, we need to have that IO per terabyte grow. And so uh, we will be producing multi-actuator drives. Um, so as a file system where it, it does affect 
we would love your feedback and any of the questions you have uh, regarding that, please feel free to ask. Yes. So. I just want to put in my vote for a in hardware mirrored ladder where I can get that kind of performance and take it, you know, it's a 14 terabyte drive and I'd love to be my, have probably the seven terabytes of actual space to get that kind of throughput. Okay. You know, drive level. Uh, obviously, it's going to be more expensive than a private drive, drive, but probably a lot less expensive than getting a 17 terabyte SSD. Uh, okay. You really want to have a mirror on the same device, or wouldn't you want to have two that you can mirror across the desk? Yeah. Yeah. Right, for redundancy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Right. I'm just talking about perform raw performance within the same, the same device. Yeah. So, and I think you can get um, raw performance right now with a mirror. I've tried it in the in just like pumping it and you get like right yeah and it, it works so and then i'll come back so. yeah so the first thing is uh you, you talked about uh you actually remove the amount of heads for actuators you have to so each actuator have like half the total heads right so how do you achieve uh, you know double the bandwidth if uh, the amount of heads per actuator is actually half the slot i would expect the iops would go up twice maybe but the bandwidth should be remaining the same so you're saying that the IOPS will go up, but the bandwidth will stay the same, mainly because the channels are different. So each of the actuator can seek, one can seek at one time and the other can be reading. And so you're basically reducing the seek time. And then by the time that settles, it can start reading. Even though the cache is shared, that each, um, that, that slide which talked about the, the engineering slide, not the... <laughs> and each had the you're thinking that all the heads are used at once, but only one head is active at a time. Oh, is that the case? Yeah, one head per actuator is active at a time. That's how it is on a single actuator drive. You only transfer from one head. So uh, dual we're transferring from two. We have two socks going through a you know, slave master and up through the channel, and we have plenty of bandwidth going up and forth. I, I thought all that has a reason to see that. That's fine. Fair. Okay. Back right there. So um, there is... So th there's two ways to look at it. Every time you add a new part to any kind of hardware, you're, the, you know, you're basically adding a, a new failure domain. Is that um, adding, that means that theoretically the dual, dual actuator drive will have worse reliability than a single actuator. But in practice, the kind of errors that you would find in the field, which is, um, you know, head going bad, um, there's some um, maybe contamination, some of the other stuff. The, the, it is so unlikely to have a pivot or an actuator level failure that it, essentially for anybody else, the reliability doesn't change. But if you do the actual, you know, like theoretical math, just because you added a new actuator, obviously there, there is a, a bit of a difference. So uh, my big thing uh, when I was listening to this is basically there are a lot of assumptions in not just the investment, but a lot of file systems. I, I understand why you broke the uh, license to two blocks. But there's a lot of assumptions about uh, devices being kind of separate in terms of failure domains. So again, like if I wanted to create a SQL like this, you in, in your like uh, demo, you created two pools, one out of you know one one half of the hard drive and one out of the other. Um, and I think most of us uh, use a single pool on you know on of our, course on yep our, uh, you know, for, for all of our data, and that allows us to do like that's not that that also gives us some additional abilities in terms of doing different things like economically. Right. Um, doing things uh, with like dev, uh, with uh, DM RAID or any other thing like that, there, there is like a performance cost that comes with that. There are some things that in uh, that device mappers, it's just not that good at. Uh, the, thing, the other thing that I'm a bit concerned about though is um, just the performance of the, based on how you describe the actuators, uh, I understand that you know for sequential reads you can get really good um, you know almost double uh, uh, performance, but it's also interesting because I know our code kind of assumes that each need be dev and pool is separate from a performance perspective, so there's separate queues uh, you know for each one, and they're kind of a lot of that code is kind of based off of that idea that that they like you know that the, that the performance of one is independent on another. So it's, it's I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Like like it, I'm just uh, uh, I'm a bit so, concerned because Google Bots kind of breaks a lot of assumptions that we have, and 
even though it might like work, it probably I'm not sure if there's a way. So what you're making a case for is a single one but dual actuator, right? I mean, because that would uh, ease the failure domain problem. So right. that's that's one feedback, but go ahead. I, mean, I would ask if the, like your your concerns about performance being coupled, but I mean, I'd like to hear like is is the performance coupled? So we you don't get two x every time for a workload that is like in our mix. That's why the one of the slides talks about that you can get 1.7x worse to but 2x. If you had two it, actual physical, like two drives each with their own actuator, like would you also get 1.7x or would you get 2x? You know, like the comparison that we're thinking is like, you're telling me I have two drives in one, you know, in one right. box. Is the performance the same as if I had two drives in two different boxes? No, no, you would get 2x of two different drives the dual actuator is giving you 1.7x in some scenarios. It has to okay. do some with the shared cache. There's a little bit of traffic management, uh, the, uh, the master slave, in. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, seek management that's going on. Okay. And that's where you see sequentials are very close to 2x. Uh, randoms tend to be a little bit softer than 2x, 1.7, 1.8, and that's as to just some of the management within the drive. So. Yeah, I mean, it's you're getting. I mean, uh, in our early deployments, dual lines are they're treating it like two separate drives and getting pretty close to two x performance in the scenarios they're looking at. But your other point, the failure domain management is very important. Failure domain awareness, and that's the whole argument about you know maybe we'll do a single LUN flat LBA space that way it's abstracted up and you can do whatever you want up in the up in the stack and be well aware of the failure domains of that space. Yeah, because like for instance we run RAID Z2 and so if we had like mm -hmm. one of these drives failed and it counts for two. So maybe in the hackathon, I would love to hear from people who, because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious how the record size applies to this. So if you had a flat LBA space, how would the, would the record size and all these other knobs be able to take the most advantage of a dual actuator? So a flat LBA space is you have a 14 terabyte drive and the um, it shows up as one LUN, but one of the you know zero to seven is on one actuator and, and the other one is in the other. Could it be like could we do something where like it does kind of a rate zero between the two? Like, you could, I mean like on the software side you can. No, you can do like, a, I mean within the hard drive itself, like the, the exposed LUN, yes, if, like we have a sector zero on an actuator, you know, and then like, you're you're talking about interleave, like sector zero on one and sector two on the other, and whatever the size may be. Yeah. So I mean, there's a trade-offs for that, right? I mean, so uh, there are issues where when you cross that LUN boundary, you're going to actually uh, cause the performance to drop because then your then your read is now dependent on both actuators rather than on one. Now, if you can keep the boundary like a hardware rate could, like in hardware rate, you have a stripe size and it never goes around the stripe size, then you can actually have an interleave and really good performance. So I don't know how ZFS internals are, so I don't, I don't want to work, but that's the kind of feedback me and James yeah, and have that's to kind of. Yeah, the kind of thing we've, we've thought about, we can do an internal striking, and it's hard to get alignment, but if that's done in software, you can set the stripe size uh, optimally from, from your workload and application perspective. And it's hard for us to know, one, what the stripe size is, and two, it's harder for the stack to manage to a Given stripe size and one that you guys choose. So that, I don't think we have a question, sorry. Other than the, the flush command, is there other things you could do to one button that would kill the performance than the other one? Let's take that, take it offline. Okay. Um, get to the yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you.